Hello and welcome to lecture number 13. Today, we will address two important aspects of life in the United States in the years before the Civil War. Travel westward and life in the Old South. These two images help to visualize the range of issues to be discussed today. On the top we see a group of men mining for gold in California. This addresses the first theme of how and why people traveled to the American West. Secondly, we see a portrait of a southern family. The presentation will address life under slavery for African Americans and profile southern society. Once the United States acquired new territory in the West, and even before so, many traveled to the region for a variety of reasons. There were many reasons why people traveled westward, but one important motivation was religious. A fair number of missionaries, such as Marcus and Narcissa Whitman, traveled westward to spread Christianity. However, one large group of religious travelers were followers of the Mormon faith. The Mormon Church is more properly known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Its founder was Joseph Smith. In the late 1820s, while living as a farmer in New York, an angel led him to some sacred tablets which he translated and later published in 1830 as the Book of Mormon. While critics argued his claims were far-fetched, his church grew quickly. He and his followers moved to Ohio, then Missouri, and finally settled in Illinois. The arrows on this map identify the different locations of Mormon settlements. They initially traveled to Kirtland, Ohio, then Missouri, and finally established a model community in Nauvoo, Illinois. They continued moving because of the persecution faced by members of the Mormon Church. Mormon followers faced persecution for many reasons. First, the Book of Mormon's new revelations appeared to undermine the Bible's Old and New Testaments, prompting the wrath of many Protestants. Mormons also tended to vote in blocks, while Smith was not only a religious leader, he also served as mayor. This seemed to blur the separation of church and state in the areas where they lived. Finally, they were accused of odd sexual practices following the introduction of polygamy in 1841. In 1844, Joseph Smith was jailed in Illinois and then murdered by a mob. The Mormon church was now leaderless and in jeopardy of falling apart. For more information about the LDS Church, you may click on the hyperlink below to their official website, as well as another link to the Church's official biography of Joseph Smith. Following Smith's death, a new leader emerged. His name was Brigham Young. The goal of Young and other Mormon followers was simple. They wanted to practice their religion without persecution from outside groups. In 1847, they began an overland migration to what is now Utah in hopes they could observe their faith in isolation. The Mormon Trail is identified here as they began their journey in Illinois and then traveled westward to Utah. Many Mormon followers compared their experiences to the Puritans who left England as they faced religious persecution themselves and also sought to establish a religious utopia. Utah's harsh desert environment proved to be a difficult place to live. However, settlers in and around Salt Lake City worked together and developed innovative methods to irrigate the land. By the end of 1848, over 5,000 settlers had arrived. When Utah finally became a state in 1896, it boasted a population of more than 200,000 with over 260,000 acres of irrigated land. Another factor influencing travel westward was the prospect of obtaining free land. To encourage settlement and reward those who had already been living in Oregon for many years, in 1850 Congress passed the Donation Land Claim Act. This offered free land in the Oregon country. First, adult white male citizens were entitled to 320 acres of land. If married, their spouse could receive an additional 320 acres in her own right. While the legislation addressed land in the entire Oregon country, most of it was handed out in the fertile Willamette Valley in western Oregon. The final provision, as discussed here, identifies the settlers' responsibilities. 
Individuals who obtained the land were required to occupy it for a minimum of four years and improve it. Improvements could include clearing trees, planting crops, building a home, or other actions. Over the next five years, about two and a half million acres of land was doled out under this legislation. It created a tremendous opportunity for many. However, participation was limited to whites. Free blacks and native Hawaiians were excluded. There was a small but significant Hawaiian population which had been in place since the fur trading era who were ineligible for this free land. One additional factor which led people to travel to the American West was the discovery of gold in California. In January of 1848, gold was discovered in California outside of Sacramento at a mill owned by John Sutter. President Polk confirmed the news in a message to Congress he sent in December of 1848. The first huge wave of prospectors looking to strike it rich came in 1849. Between 1848 and 1852, the non-white population of California skyrocketed from 14,000 to over 225,000. At first, gold miners worked individually, each with a shovel and pan. According to some reports, these 49ers could earn $50 a day, equivalent to two months' wages for workers in the North. By the 1850s, devices like the one shown here, a long tom, were used, where miners worked together in groups. California became a meeting ground for people from all over the world. Prospectors came from America's East Coast and Midwest. However, they also came from Mexico, Chile, Peru, Europe, Hawaii, Australia, and Asia. By the mid-1850s, about 20% of the miners were Chinese. This image shows black and white miners sifting for gold. Migration to California's gold fields was overwhelmingly undertaken by men. About 95% of the gold rush migrants were male. Some struck it rich in California and made fortunes. However, most did not. There was money to be made selling items to prospectors. One such supplier was a German migrant named Levi Strauss, whose tough mining pants were popular items. For more information about the gold rush, you may click on the hyperlink below. Now that we've explored why people traveled to the West, we can investigate how they undertook their journeys. Some traveled to the West by sea. It was an expensive way to travel, but it also was quicker. For those living along the east coast of the United States who had enough money, they could take a ship. Passengers were transported from the Atlantic coast all the way around the tip of South America and onward to the west coast as the Panama Canal had not yet been built. If they took this route, California's gold fields were the most common destination. While some did travel by sea, the overwhelming majority of those who traveled westward took overland trails. It's estimated that between 1840 and 1860, approximately 300,000 individuals did so. Of those, the most common destination was California. About 200,000 traveled there, while over 50,000 went to Oregon and more than 40,000 journeyed to Utah. In general, the trip itself took between four to six months, depending upon where one began their journey and the weather conditions. The chief expense was for transportation. A wagon, oxen, and other gear often cost approximately $400, and there were other supplies to be purchased. The very poor couldn't afford to travel, and the very rich often wouldn't be interested in making this journey. So, the most common people traveling were of the middling classes. The most common jumping-off point was Independence, Missouri. It circled in red on the map. Depending upon the traveler's destination, the trails would taper off as one might journey to Santa Fe, Salt Lake City, Sacramento, or even Oregon City. Can you imagine walking 2,000 miles over mountains, fording rivers in the hot and in the cold, with a spouse and young children? Life on these trails was rough. The biggest fear for many settlers was that of an Indian attack. However, the reality was that most interaction with Native Americans was quite positive. Overall, the journey was only moderately dangerous, as the average death rate was less than 5%. The biggest killers were disease and accidents. For more information about life on the overland trails, you may click on the hyperlink below.
the presentation will now switch subjects and address several aspects of life in the Old South, beginning with some characteristics of slavery. One of the important concepts to consider when addressing slavery would be the expansion of the institution over time. This map identifies the distribution of slaves in the United States in 1790. Notice the regions with the highest concentration of slave populations were located in the southeast, along the Atlantic coastline. If you remember this slide from a previous presentation, it was the perfection of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney in the 1790s that led to a major expansion of cotton plantations and slave labor in the United States as cotton was shipped to textile mills in the north and particularly Great Britain. This chart identifies the expansion of cotton as an export crop as compared to other American exports. As you can see, beginning in 1800, cotton accounted for about 7% of American exports, yet it rose steadily over the next several decades. By 1860, its production exploded to make up more than 57% of the nation's exports. As we compare the two maps, by 1860, slavery had spread throughout the entire South, and slaves were most heavily concentrated in the states of the Deep South. Small-scale cotton farms did not require slave labor to be profitable, but as large-scale production of cotton expanded, so too did slavery. Here's one final figure reinforcing the concept that cotton production and slavery grew together in the Old South. In 1790, there were just fewer than 700,000 slaves living in the United States, and cotton production was limited. However, over the years, more cotton was produced, and the number of slaves reached nearly 4 million by 1860. We can now explore some aspects of slave life in the Old South. Slavery in the United States changed dramatically between the early 18th and mid-19th centuries. In the 18th century, male slaves outnumbered females by large percentages, and many had been born in Africa. In later years, the sex ratio became more even, and the number of native-born slaves increased. Congress outlawed the African slave trade in 1808. Most slaves worked on large plantations with ten or more slaves. On these plantations, they were usually closely supervised and worked in gangs. The image here shows a modest planter working alongside his slaves as well as with some other white employees. Narratives, like one written by former slave Solomon Northup, offer insight into slave life. Most days, slaves were awakened before sunrise, where they ate a quick breakfast and went out into the fields. Their day was long, particularly when cotton was harvested. They usually worked from sunrise to sunset. At noon, they ate a quick meal and then went back to the fields. Northup's master expected his slaves to pick at least 200 pounds of cotton. If they picked less, they would be whipped. If they picked more, they faced a new quota the following day. Once they were done in the fields, they completed additional chores. Slaves could expect a small amount of cornmeal and three to four pounds of salted pork as food for each week. They often supplemented their diet with a small vegetable garden. Northup caught fish and described roasted possum as a delicacy. Slaves worked six days a week, but could earn extra money if they worked on Sundays, which was expected at times. Christmas was a welcomed holiday. Celebrations lasted over three, if not more, days, and it was the only time they could eat to their fill. Northup describes many beatings he and other slaves received at the hands of their masters. Slaves were sometimes whipped for minor offenses. It just depended upon the slave owner. In the early 1800s, some planters adopted this so-called restraining mask to punish their slaves. Slaves developed many coping strategies as they dealt with their life under slavery. One strategy was to maintain close family ties. Marriages may not have been legally recognized unions, but they were encouraged by slave owners and offered a network of support for family members. However, there was always a potential that family members could be separated from one another. This map shows the internal slave trade in the United States. Many slave owners from the Upper South made large profits selling slaves to whites living in the Lower South or Southwest, where slavery was expanding. 
This image of a slave auction catches what many believed were the worst aspects of slavery, as family members might be ripped apart, never to see one another again. Another coping strategy included resistance. This slide was shown in an earlier presentation, but it represents the wide range of reactions undertaken by slaves. Solomon Northup's narrative includes numerous examples of subtle, and not so subtle resistance, on the part of himself and other slaves. A majority of slaves engaged in some sort of subtle resistance. They stole food or other items, faked illnesses, worked incredibly slowly, and even manipulated situations to their advantage. Some slaves attempted to run away. Here we see many different routes included in what some called the Underground Railroad, an informal network of safe homes which provided a haven for slaves fleeing northward. Harriet Tubman was one former slave who led fugitives to freedom over the Underground Railroad. Others, like Nat Turner shown here, conspired to stage a major rebellion. After several years of planning in 1831, Turner, along with other slaves, raided the homes of several Virginia planters. As many as 60 whites of all ages were killed. The rebellion was soon put down, and whites retaliated by executing Turner and his associates while killing many other slaves in the region at random. Another coping strategy employed by slaves involved religion. Some slave owners encouraged their slaves to practice Christianity, hoping it could be used to control their slaves. However, slaves often spoke of the promised land of freedom, and identified with stories of Jews in the Old Testament enslaved by the Egyptians. The image shown here is from a free black congregation in the north, but many slaves embraced Christianity as well. White Southern society in the years prior to the Civil War had several unique characteristics. A variety of justifications developed in support of the institution of slavery. The arguments were racist, and many declared it was natural for those of African ancestry to be enslaved. The Bible was used to justify slavery as many pointed to the curse of Ham, where Noah cursed the son of Ham, declaring, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. This passage can be found in the book of Genesis from chapter 9. Other passages were also used to justify harsh treatment of slaves, like this one from Exodus. When a slave owner strikes a male or female slave with a rod, and the slave dies immediately, the owner shall be punished. But, if the slave survives a day or two, there is no punishment, for the slave is the owner's property. Many slave owners used a passage from the New Testament's book of Ephesians as they hoped to use Christianity to control their slaves' behavior. It reads, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as you obey Christ. For an insightful conversation about the curse of Ham from NPR, you may click on the hyperlink below. Some look to history to justify slavery. The ancient Greeks and Romans had tremendous achievements. They even influenced the founders of the nation with their ideas of democracy. If their great civilizations practiced slavery, why shouldn't the United States? Even the United States Constitution condoned slavery with the Three-Fifths Compromise and other provisions, and the nation's founders, such as Washington and Jefferson, also owned slaves. Slave owners also thought of themselves as paternalistic. Just as a child needs help to get through life, they argued slaves were members of their family, and owners provided the assistance they needed. They also brought Christianity and civilization to a group of people they thought of as inferior to themselves. Finally, in the South, they argued that they took care of their slaves. They were provided with food, shelter, clothing, and even medical care when they became ill. Additional arguments came from a man named George Fitzhugh. He was a supporter of what came to be known as the pro-slavery argument. Fitzhugh compared life for slaves in the South to conditions faced by factory workers in the North and described factory workers as wage slaves. Wage earners only received a paycheck and no one cared about their homes, clothing, food, or other necessities. Instead, Fitzhugh argued, slave owners cared for their slaves and even looked after them as they grew older. Of course, the arguments of men like Fitzhugh and others who justified slavery were racist and only considered part of the story. They didn't discuss the separation of families with the slave trade. 
They didn't try to explain why, if conditions were so great, so many slaves tried to run away. They also failed to acknowledge the violence and degradation associated with slavery overall. Southern society was also structured in a very unique manner. The plantation mistress had a unique role in Southern families. As this painting infers, Southern women were expected to defer to their husbands. However, at the same time, they were also expected to be harsh toward black servants working in the household. Another portrait shown here demonstrates an additional interpretation of the ideal plantation. Here we see a slave waiter and nurse essentially at the feet of this great planter and his mistress. The great planter appears to overshadow everything in his presence. In many ways, Southern society in 1860 was organized like a triangle, with very few near the top and many on the bottom. At the pinnacle, making up about 1% of the population were the great planters who owned 20 or more slaves. Next came small farmers. They owned their own land and encompassed about 35-45% to 45 of society. Some were slaveholders, some were not. They might own up to five slaves, if that many. Next came landless whites, who made up about 20 to 25 percent of the population. At the bottom of society, yet providing its foundation, would be slaves, which included about 35 percent of the population in the Old South. One trait lost on many is the fact that most white Southerners were not slave owners. About 75% of white southern families owned no slaves. This statistic begs the question, well, then why would southern whites fight in the Civil War to protect slavery if they didn't own any slaves? In fact, some of the most ardent supporters of secession were whites who did not own slaves. This is a complicated question. First, freeing the slaves did not become a war aim of the Union until about two years into the war when Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. This will be discussed in more detail in a later lecture. Another factor was that individuals in the Deep South often identified with their local community first. They did not want invading outsiders to tell them what to do and how to live their lives. Whites also benefited from maintaining the status quo in Southern society for several reasons. The first is social. The large plantations owned by the great planters were the center of social life in the Old South. This slide was shown in a previous lecture and identified some characteristics of Chesapeake society. Notice the highlighted section. Important social affairs where one might meet a future wife or husband, be they a barbecue, a dance, wedding, or another important event, were often held at the home of a community's most successful member. Secondly, large planters very often lent a helping hand to small farmers. If it was time to pick cotton and a small farmer needed additional pickers, he could go to a large planter and hire them. The great planters might own 50, 100, or even more slaves. Why not spare a few? If a small farmer became sick or injured, they would often go to the great planter who might sell or even give them a few pigs. What was the difference to him? He could spare the extra pork, but it could make the difference between having meat on the table or not the following winter for the small farmer. Finally, small farmers may have resented the arrogance of the large planters, but they often strove toward the same goal. They wanted to become great planters themselves. Overall, there really were a wide range of reasons why non-slaveholding whites would fight in the Civil War. By the way, all Southern whites had something in common with one another, from the richest to the poorest in the Old South. At least they weren't slaves. As shown with the previous diagram, black slaves were the bottom of Southern society, so as long as slavery existed, even the poorest whites found themselves up from the bottom. There were many important concepts included in this presentation. This presentation should have prepared you to write two essays, each with a different focus. First, you should be able to write about how and why people traveled to the American West. In what ways did this westward movement impact the nation?
Secondly, you should be able to describe and evaluate life in the Old South. What would motivate whites living in the American South to fight in the Civil War even if they didn't own slaves? This concludes lecture number 13. I hope the presentation of this material has helped you to understand these subjects more clearly. The next few slides will include hyperlinks to additional information as well as sources used to create this presentation. Have a great day.